Welcome, everyone, to today's afternoon session of the Founding Lab program. Then, during the Education Day, I have the honors of introducing our stage host for the whole afternoon session. They were flying in from the University of Lancaster, and we're super grateful to have you here. Um, they're working on a digital sciences, um, social sciences, and also transparent concepts that go beyond um, even university um, environments. They have an incredible background, not only in their own research, but also for stage facilitation of different kinds. And I've heard um, from many different sites, actually, that also their university courses are of a very special um, twist, in a way. So we're super happy to have them here today. They're very experienced in also leading conversations into depth. And this is where we want to invite every one of you today. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Lauren, for being here. And I will officially hand over the word to you right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. That's, uh, that was so kind and just so characteristic of the care and uh, inclusionary spirit that has just marked every minute of today. Uh, and Lauren and I kind of, kind of joining you. Um, it's not about us this afternoon. We're continuing the opportunity to provide a platform and a stage for the 75 students. I, was, I talked to someone at lunch saying, you're gonna have to get a tattoo or something, you know, the 75 that kind of bond you forever. Um, but this, yeah, exactly. Someone's designing it already, I can see. Um, <laughs> I'm nervous now that I might have to get one. Um, <laughs> So the 75 students that just over these two weeks have been remarkable, absolutely extraordinary in that vision, that clarity, and the generosity of spirit that you showed in taking us through, through your, your vision as well. We want to just not only bottle that and just you know, take it around the world, that, 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 those values, but we want to continue that spirit this afternoon. You, you as a group, you as a community, you as collaborators with that heart and that care and that imagination and that acceptance of difference, you, you're not alone. This isn't all on you. You're part of a network of other communities. It's, it's a bit like the multiverse. You know, there are some other universes out there where there are other groups of people right now really wrestling with the same set of questions around, yes, the future of university curricula and student progress and learning resource and quality management and curriculum design and all of those things that we need to think about when putting together the, the estate and systems and processes and cultures and personnel of, of, a, of an organization as complex as a university. Yes, there are conversations about those new models. And yes, there are conversations that are going on around digital culture and that intersection between the sciences and the arts, between the humanities and digital media, and how we might erase some of those old, orthodox, traditional, disciplinary boundaries. And a new world of post-disciplinary thinking and working could emerge. There are conversations around that but actually, there's even more at stake here. This meeting, you, are a boundary object actually to much higher stakes. This is about the future of how we collaborate on this planet in a non-competitive, equitable, non-extracting, magical, fantastical, celestial way. But again, we don't want this to feel as if it's all on you. You've worked so hard. We know your energy levels are quite low at the, at the moment. Um, so we want to reassure you, we've got your back. And actually, one of the brilliant things that's going to come from this event is not only those allies that you have inside IDSA and Ars Electronica who are going to be making that case and opening those doors for us to rush through, but actually, you've got other allies across Europe and across the world who want to carry on this conversation. So it's in that spirit that um, we come to today. We're from another university. We're from the, the University of Leicester, right bang in the middle of the UK. 
And nine months ago, we launched a brand new institute. We launched an institute for digital culture. And we leverage transdisciplinary research to help cultural organizations around the world adapt to a digital age. And we do that by doing purposeful work, really purposeful work that responds to points of need. So Lauren and I spend an awful lot of our time having very similar conversations to you. So it's been energizing and inspiring and catalytic for us to be part of these conversations. So I think the first thing and final bit of this introduction is to say thank you for having us and, and thank you for, for making us so welcome in, in your community. Lauren, we're gonna be having a very um, fluid conversation. It's a very equitable conversation this afternoon. But perhaps to, to help us kind of tune into the kind of reflectiveness and openness, um, we should think about the future. Definitely. And so to do that, and we want to make sure that we recognize that everybody you know, comes into this conversation in different ways, we have put all of the prompts and everything that we're going to go through um, on a Google document, so we can put that up on the, on the slide. Um, and you can access it and follow along as we're going through today's discussion. So first off, we've heard a lot about these different futures. You've thought a lot about the vision, the visions you want this university to be. And we really like to start these types of, of, of conversations with, let's project ourselves 10 years into the future. Let's, let's be in 2033. I want you to think about who you are in 2033. How has this university or this experience, how has it stayed with you? What skills have you learned? What relationships have you cultivated? Where are you 10 years from now? What have you done with your, with your life, with your community? Where do you exist? And we just want you to take just a couple of, just a minute, and think about what that future looks like for you. So with this future self in mind, we're gonna be asking you a couple of questions around skills, around the type of disciplines, around the type of technologies that are needed for this university to not just survive, but thrive. How does it get created? How does it live? How does it live in its students and its educators in the people that are associated with the community itself? So we'll start with the how. This is a fishbowl conversation, and I know that if you've been through a fishbowl conversation before, the setup looks a bit different. Normally you have an inner circle and an outer circle. So we're going to pretend this is our inner circle. Mm -hmm. We are having an intimate conversation. We're going to be talking amongst ourselves. Whoever is up here has the mic, has the power, okay? And we want this to be a hive of activity. So once you have said or asked your question or commented on somebody else's or yep. given your perspective, we ask you to leave that seat open, move I'm to the audience, <laughs> move to the outer circle, and leave space for somebody else to join. So don't, don't wait for us to prompt you to come up. You can come up at any time. But we're looking for multiple perspectives, multiple ways in which to answer the questions around skills, technologies, and disciplines. Now, we're holding this as a very safe space, um, and space or safety means something different to every single person. We are following our code of conduct for the entire conference, but we're really kind of zeroing in on, on respecting each other's opinions and perspectives. Whatever is shared, um, we do not attack personalities. We talk about the ideas, we talk about the perspectives, and we think about how might we be challenged? How might we live in an uncomfortable space as we think about these multiple futures? So, we'll have about 15 or so minutes for each topic. We're gonna kind of yeah. go with the flow. So if there's a topic that really gravitates, um, you know, really resonates with you and grabs your attention and it's taking you know, the space, we're gonna hold that space. But this is your time, your space, to come up and join us for the conversation. Ross, do you have anything to add? No, so we're, we're 
I say no, and now I'm going to add something. <laughs> What's going on there? No, Lauren, so let me talk. Um, start to think about, those of you that are already in the document or behind the QR code, you can see the sort of questions that are coming up. Um, an incredible array. You were really super smart and very, very open in the way that you shared the microphone this morning. And we, we met so many of the 75, so, so many of the students we've, we've heard of. Um, maybe you're somebody who is speaking later on. That's OK. You know, do, do come up for this part of the conversation. Or maybe you're somebody who hasn't had a chance to speak yet. And you know, maybe this is the moment to, to, you know, to have, that, have that moment of courage as well. Um, as we keep saying, this is not a judging space. You've got your guys around you. Um, this is your chance to, you know, to, to contribute and have your voice heard and for you to be seen and for you to be seen in this space as we hold it together. Lauren, should we get into the first round? Yes, let's do that. So we heard a lot this morning about lifelong learning, about the desire to have and build and cultivate different types of skills and how do we keep those skills um, evolve those skills, um, cultivate new skills as we move into the future. So we want to invite people up to, to start, we're actually going to start with a third question. Looking 10 to 20 years out, what challenges will graduates face that we need to help them prepare for now? So we heard a lot about your vision this morning, both from the fellows perspective, the students perspective, educators. Now we want to bring you up and we want to ask you specifics. What are those challenges, the good, the bad, and the ugly that we need to be able to address now as we're creating this new university environment? So we've got some mics up here. It's a friendly, hospitable place. I won't bite. Nobody else will bite. If anybody wants to come up and join us and help us answer these questions, or if there's another question around skills that you just felt that we needed to delve deeper into this morning, you are welcome to come up. Come on, who want, who'd like to have a go? It's a moment. I'm, I might turn to some of the fantastic. Please, come on up. We're not quite in the clappy moment yet, but there is a certain amount of, of relief. If any of the students like to come up, we're just going to start to have a gentle conversation with Lauren. If not, we may just ask some of our fellows to, 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 to come as well. Would you like to come up? Yeah, of course. Fantastic. <laughs> you know those magicians who start to have you know, people they're plucking out of the audience, you and you're never quite sure if they're a stooge or they're yeah, actually there's someone who's part of it? I feel like one of those. You know, Is this your watch? Um, any of the students that would like to come and contribute? Who'd like to come forward? Come on, there's, <laughs> there's scissors, paper, stone happening at the back of the room now to, to kind of. Yeah. Nathan, do you like to come up? Come on. Um, and we'll share the mics and feel free. This yeah. is a hive of activity, so don't hesitate to come up. And maybe we start. All right. Yeah. So, is there, is, is there, do you want to react to the third question, or is there another question that you really feel that, please, go for, go for it. I have, a, I have an urgent question. We have been <coughs> talking a lot about uh, the, uh, the aspect that interdisciplinary um, teaching and research would probably be one of the, the core ingredients of, of the new institution, but that's a, a, a real, um, ambivalent uh, from, a, from a skills point of view. The question is, when I, how can we teach interdisciplinary um, skills? By not sacrificing the idea that f at university level you should also, you know, dive a little bit, uh, dive a little bit deeper. So that's uh, a, a, a thrilling question for me and I have actually no answer, so I'm, I'm really interested in your ideas. So I'm wondering if those on stage, how would you like to react to that? I have, I have maybe two suggestions. The first is that the way to learn interdisciplinary skills is to work in teams. Because there's skills like, like planning and organizing and interacting with different people and that you can only really learn by doing. So I think uh, working in teams across disciplines is one way to learn interdisciplinary skills. And I think for myself, it's okay? been interesting because I had no idea really what this was gonna be when I applied. And it's been interesting to have creative space and to have that ability that I, I could go and learn something new. I never thought I, I would ever really manage to go and learn things about artificial intelligence or machine learning and 
I, I ended up in the artificial intelligence group and it was a bit of a surprise. But actually, that accessibility of learning, the way that walls can be broken down and spaces can be creative and collaborative, means that there's an incentive and a freedom for people who wouldn't move out of their specialism to actually explore that. And I think it's from there that you get a lot of the most creative ideas from that cross-disciplinary thinking. But I do agree that it's important for people to dive deep into things. Uh, does, that that require, does that require some type of safety or some type of guardrails, that type of the building of community before that collaboration can occur? So when you're working with a team, I'm curious, like, what did you need to have in place, that scaffolding that you needed to have in place to feel like you could learn and really work with these different people? I think it's really important to feel like you have a perspective that's worthwhile. Because coming, you know, it would have been really easy for me to feel completely out of my depth here because I've never, I, I, I've never had any particular coding training or arts training. I mean, I, I play the trombone, which, you know, <laughs> It's not the most artistic of instruments, really. You don't get a, a maestro trombone player very often. But okay. the, uh, maybe it'll be me. The, <laughs> the point is that it could, would have been very easy to feel out, like, completely lost. But actually, if you feel valid in your own presence, like teamwork, the first, the first point of teamwork is working with yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you feel secure, if you manage to be secure and welcome in that sense, that's a really important foundation, I think, for that kind of expansion. Excellent. So uh, I, I totally share that, but what I think is even more important for the future is that the times are changing so quickly. So in the last past times we had like circles of uh, economy floating to depressions with five, ten year circles and now it's starting to be so quick so people have to adapt to societal changes in a very different manner. So there is corona coming up and then everything also in education in terms of collaboration changes within one second. So I think what we really need to tell those people and to, to bring them is to be flexible. To be flexible together and not be separated. I think that's really what, what I hope that, that we manage to do so because I think otherwise we will be lost because everybody's doing its own, let's say, shit and we will not get better from that. So I think I hope at least that we will find a way to, to really hope and, and broaden up the, the mind of the people for flex security. Would you like to add something? I think it's all about failure. I think we're oh. all scared of failure and yeah. um, being vulnerable and be accepting that we all fa fail from time to time. And no one remembers the bad, terrible artworks that I've made but they remember the good works that I've made. So I think this way of being flexible and learning to test and drive new things, collaborate, that may fail, that's okay, and keep going. Because I think to adapt to this rapid changing world, we have to, things aren't going to work and we have to be okay with that. That's I think failure is the best way to say. So I'm a chemist and we have a lot of publications <laughs> for things that worked out, but it's impossible to publish any data which failed because you cannot publish in high-ranked journals and then you do not get any uh, good index and you will never be a good PhD, postdoc, whatever. So if there would be a journal of unpublishable data with all the failed experiments, yes. <laughs> it, would, it would really definitely broaden up all those um, experiments and save so much time. Everybody's doing the same things again. And I think that not only applies to chemistry, but to all of the visions. So maybe we can, can make a safe space for failed experiments mm -hmm. and then really maybe look from another perspective on those and then keep growing. Yeah, that's very, it, it, the, the, the ways in which we are coming into maybe this new university environment, we need to realize the baggage or, or the different perspectives we have in the current environments. And if we are reinforcing in the current environments, reinforcing that performance, that excellence that you talked about this morning, you know, what could we do to flip that? How do we create a new future, a new reality that allows for that space? That's, that's great, that's brilliant. When you came up, did you want to address a question or different? I just want to challenge the answer, I mean. Oh, okay, <laughs> challenge, challenge away. I, I, I mean, I'm, I sympathize with your view and I think this, uh, on, a, on a procedural level, uh, it's very true what you're saying, but I have very trivial problems. Uh, I, 
for me, I'm, I'm a trained computer scientist, and in my, in my, let's say, at that time, it would be nowadays it would be called bachelor's degree, uh, I had to study 50% of my time math. And then there was the other 50% more or less were computer science and some side, uh, some side uh, issues. Now, if I want to be a, uh, an expert in a second field like uh, social sciences at the same time, I have to sacrifice something. So either I am, uh, and, and the danger being uh, a very superficial uh, expert in all these fields. And that is not what my vision from a uh, uh, university level is. So I'm, I'm just don't see the, the how to meet the ends. Is, is yeah? part of that skill development maybe recognizing where, where you need to find the bridge or you need to find an interpreter, you need to find the scientist, you need to, right? You, it, it's, it's not necessarily being the expert in that field, but what questions, what skills can you help develop the relationship or develop the bridge? Which I, I see you nodding, please. Yes, we could make a great app together. You're a computer scientist, I'm an artist. We could make something amazing. Yeah, we could collaborate. that would be great. <laughs> we, yeah, that, this is how it works. We break those barriers down and we create something. Yeah, but then we are, we are two disciplinary persons mm -hmm. working together. Yes. We are not one interdisciplinary person. That's a different aspect. So maybe, maybe that's the way we do it. We, we don't talk about interdisciplinary persons. We're talk, only talking about interdisciplinary teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that could, be, uh, could work out. But then we need to train also again our students to become in some way disciplinary students because otherwise do we, you don't do we get have disciplinary some teams. Yeah, please. But, okay. But Who would like to sacrifice their... Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Sit down, please. You're part of the conversation. Okay. Oh, I, I didn't want to come again, but I just... We, because my field is computational social science, which is exactly <laughs> what you mentioned. <laughs> but I'm not original, neither a, a computer scientist nor a social scientist. I'm an architect. Um, so yeah, th doing this kind of transition was a lot of work and it required years of study for me to actually get it my, for an advisor to want to take me in so that I could show him that I had done a lot of work to be reasonably decent at this. Um, and I had done no coding in my life until I actually joined KAIS, which was a year ago. So I can do most of my coding nowadays, my analysis, which I learned mostly by myself with the support of my fellow lab mates. Um, but I am, there's a lot of things that I cannot do and for that I need, I can count on the help of people that are better than me. So I am sacrificed, I will not be a computer scientist, but I know just enough to talk to the computer scientists that I work with so that I know what they're doing and they will go and do the things that I don't know what to do, how to do. So I think the point of the digital sciences is not that I will be a perfect computer scientist and social scientist, but that we need each other to work together, but we need to understand what the other is doing. Mm -hmm. it, that, that's more of the point. It's not something that you can do individually like you could do with the other, uh, with the previous, the more traditional, let's put it like this, fields. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's more like a mixture of interdisciplinary and post-disciplinary. I think that's what I heard in the morning. It really it describes it well because you have the people really deeply into something and then you have bridging people from, from yeah. different disciplines. But I'm totally with you. They have to speak the same language. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to collaborate. That common and so ground. I think that's yeah. one of our goals we have to do. We have to tell them how to talk to each other and, and, and translate their languages somehow. Oh, you want to? No, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I think. <laughs> so I used to date an engineer. <laughs> and I, I come from like humanities, art, architecture in Brazil is a very humanities and art center uh, school. And I used to date an engineer, programmer, and we really liked each other, but we could not, we, we could not, even if we wanted to be together, we could not make the effort to understand each other's side. Problem. It, that was a really, 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 really important point for me to think about why interdisciplinarity fails. Um, because we kind of really wanted to make things work, but uh, we were really stuck in our worldview and most importantly, our, the priorities of our field. 
And that is one of the things, like what, do, what is the, the reason why each of these fields exist? When you, are con when you are talking to a different field, you cannot prioritize your own worldview and your own priorities. So I don't think it's so much about translating, but compromising on, on what's important. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of partnerships that work. Like when I read a computational social science paper, I know if the main author is, is a social scientist or a computer scientist. But usually, even if the main author is from a field or the other, you're gonna have like people collaborating, yes. But it's about negotiating these priorities. Like what is the most important thing in a paper about social sciences? It cannot be the same in the computational social science paper, for example. We're gonna, we're actually gonna, okay. Just, just one yep. more thing to add. I think it's the problem when you're talking about papers is also where to publish those data. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think yeah. that's one of the most important things. So we just went through, oh, we've, if you come on stage, come on stage. No, 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 it belongs to all of us here. We're holding this space, come on up. So maybe it's uh, not the right topic because it's about skills, but it is about skills because I just want to say maybe it's not about the skills, it's not about the how we do something. But now that we go beyond this stage of where everyone has to be perfect, perfect, perfect in one field and is afraid to fail, if yeah. mm -hmm. um, maybe it's about even more the why we do something. And so that's why, and this lovely lady over here who just left because of me, <laughs> Amanda. when she told her story that you found your scientist yeah. and you found her because you talked about the why you wanted to heal people what I understood it's about medicine and health and so that's how you found each other and now you figure out how to do it that's not you know that's not rocket science how to do stuff I mean it is because other people train 20 years to be the perfect rocket scientist but you can find this this person you have this meta level of vision. You want to reach this goal and you will find your way. And this is the new skill, I think, to find the right people. So what are the skills you need to find the right people? How you can mm -hmm. make the connection, the communication, um, and then how to stay together because you need other power to, you need other skills to get into power, but very different skills to stay in power and to, mm -hmm. to have the stamina to go through this and to keep the team together. and. Um, I have a very big um, a startup background as well, so this, it's like a band. You have to hold the band <laughs> together and you have to go through thick, thick and thin and realize not everyone can do everything. So yeah. um, I think maybe it's really about the why and the purpose. That's a great, that's a great way to end this particular section. I really appreciate uh, Let's, yeah. oh, you want to add something on this topic? Sure, go for it. <laughs> Sorry. Final closing thought on this topic? Uh, so. Uh, I just put the same question on chat GPT. I'm sorry, I just put it on because I was just using the technology just to have an idea. So it came out with multiple solutions that 15 or 20, you know that it comes out with bullet points. But what I think the universities right now are missing because we have to identify the challenges and then provide solution for. Uh, right now, especially in third world countries, what they are missing is they don't prepare students for life and life hits them very hard. So there is a part of the life which is failure, which can be during your, I would say after 10, 20 years, during your job, in your professional life, or maybe in your personal life. But generally, how to deal with the failure or maybe deal with setbacks, universities do not prepare you for this. And generally, people learn mm. them by, by themselves. And for some people, it might be a good learning journey, but for some people, it becomes very hard and they do I would say fall into the pits of maybe depression or something else and it becomes very difficult for them to put together their life again and then so what I would want that the future university should have a very strong I would say alumni network sort of thing or maybe connection to that university so that the students can have some sort of I would say belonging to mm. where they can go back and maybe learn a new skill so if the uh, if, the, if there is a new technology and, my, and the kind of work I was doing become redundant, it doesn't matter. I can go back to my place, learn a new skill, maybe in a six months, a short course, maybe a two year degree, and then come back it and I'm prepared for the work. Yeah, yeah, that's the kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry to, to add to this. Um, I think like the culture of failure has to change. In my history or past, it was really like not allowed to fail. Now it, it seems 
it's strange that it still seems to be like that. It's very sad because failure, you just have to reinterpret the term. Without failure, we would never have a happy mm -hmm. accident. We would have not so many great things. There is no right and wrong anyway. It's just in our interpretation. So we really have to rethink what is our reality and what is black and white and is there even black and white. And so I think it's, it, it, we need a much more deeper thought process and, and reinterpretation process of the whole thing and, and start to understand that failure also is good. <laughs> this, this is a hot topic. We're, well, we're going to keep going. Go for it. I just have one thing to add, which is that a, you can succeed on every, everything you wanted to succeed on, but it's, it can still be a failure if you succeed by not taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's a failure that we don't pay enough attention to. So that's important. Thank you so much. This was a great, this was a great way to kick off this conversation. So, yes. It's vulnerable to get up That's on a awesome. stage. Thank, thank you. So we thank talked a you. lot this morning about the infrastructure. We talked a lot about physically being in community with one another and the power of that. But now we're going to talk about maybe some of the technologies, the scaffolding that keeps those connections moving or that helps us create new connections. So Ross, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I think it's interesting that we've just touched upon questions around, around new technologies. There's a, there's a very practical side of building a new university. We will have those, that credo, those values and those principles. We'll, you know, we'll interrogate the new pedagogies. We will, you know, we will demolish and bring down disciplinary um, kind of structures and silos between academic subjects if that's what's needed. We will create a new culture of kind of support and respect and collaboration and community. But we've got to deliver it. You know, people, people have to show up. They have to be supported. There, there has to be an infrastructure. So help us now. Those of you that particularly are thinking about technologies and those of you that are using technologies in your creative work in the summer school, let's think about ed tech. Let's think about that first question. What are the technologies that are going to distinguish this new university? And let's remind ourselves, this is about a new university that will be about digital media, but it will also use digital media as well. It will be a distinguishing characteristic of its pedagogy and its teaching and learning will be its use of technology. So it's about technology. It is equipping us to use technology. But technology is also the space, the platform, the medium through which this learning and teaching takes place. So please, who'd like to, to kind of come forward? I'm, you know, would you like to, he's picking people out of the, out of the order. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, who else would like to kind of help us think now about some of those education platforms that, that maybe, and I'm, I'm reluctant to start pulling people out of the crowd, but please, is it some of the collaborative spaces? Is it those Miro boards and those other extraordinary mighty network spaces that you've been using? Or if forward? you have a bad experience Please. with one of those, you can definitely talk about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, who's already managed to get the URL for the Journal of Unpublishable Data? Can you think, <laughs> someone get onto that now? Because that was a genius idea. Yeah. We need to have the business model up and running by the end of this session. Okay. So we, we can start. Please, please. <laughs> Say again. No, no, I was just saying who's in the table. <laughs> it's all in there. Please, please take a seat. So we'll start by, by starting to, are you happy to? Sure, sure. <clears throat> so help us, the technologies that are gonna, gonna help these new models of interaction. Yeah, sure. First of all, just a question, just show of hands. Does anyone hate Miro boards other than me? <laughs> it's, it's so hate Miro boards that these sort of shared space, like a big, sort of like, um, you know, like working on a whiteboard, but with Miro, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hate it because, uh, um, my spelling's terrible, and I always feel like I'm making a mistake, like, and I don't know how many people are watching me, like, make the mistake, or, like, sort of a weird feeling. Anyway, <clears throat> but that's just an aside. I saw lots of hands, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> each to their own. It's okay. Yeah, I'm not complaining either. I'm happy to use the mirror board, but I just wanted to check. But, um, I mean, one thing that, that I've been thinking about lately is just um, how conversational AI would have really helped me when I was at university being... I mean, I did a, you know... Um, uh, 
communications media degree, so really, and very in a, in a uni where they really weren't happy to share space with the um, computer science department. Mm -hmm. But I did get to take a couple of computer science subjects, which were good, and I sort of worked my way through, and would have, you know, pretty bad marks, but got through, but wouldn't have been able to get that far if it hadn't been for a bunch of, all Indian guys actually, that lived in the Unix lab, in the underground lab that was open 24 hours. They didn't live there, but they just hung out there heaps, and they were super helpful. Just looking over my shoulder, pointing out syntax mistakes and stuff like that. And it just occurred to me one day that if I'd gone to uni during COVID and had to do that from home, which would is a completely doable thing, you know, working in a terminal, uh, I wouldn't have passed those subjects at all. And um, so it sort of made me think, you know, with these conversational AIs that are so good at, you know, making suggestions and talking and stuff, like, I mean, I'm sure people are already working on it, but I wonder, you know, if they might be wonderful sort of personalised learning tools, you know, like a friend that can pick up your mistakes as you're making them and, and really accelerate the speed at which people can, um, can learn. There are many universities that are spending hundreds of thousands of pounds a year on the licences for their virtual learning environments that enable them to use a very 20th century factory, flat file, database, bookshelf approach to learning. And it's as if, you know, overnight, um, that's, that's crumbling down and it will be new tools. You know, people generating answers on the fly by a tool in, on their phone um, that will allow us to have different conversations. Where, where are we going with this conversation? Yeah. Here, back again, it's just uh, because my, my most recent startup, um, they built Holodex. And Holodex is a shared environment, a uh, shared vi virtual environment where you physically are in the space with a lot of other people. And of course, education is, for me, the most important use case of that. Mm. So I think a Holodex can really be great if for, for history, for physics, for mm. psychology classes, language maybe. You can be in Paris without being in Paris with a lot of other people and it feels real, more real than like just on a flat screen. And I, although I'm in the VR field for such a long time, I'm maybe the most, like the, the biggest critic of it because I am in it. But uh, for education, I think in terms of, because you need experience, like some subjects are best learned through experience and on the holodeck you can really do that. So maybe we can see more of those. Every empty gym in any school can be turned into a holodeck very cheaply and then children. I, now I really think more about like a kid's education more than maybe university level um, would be so, it would be transformed completely. Uh, <coughs> every good conversation needs a contrarian, so I'm, I, don't, I think sometimes I'm good at playing that. I'm, I like Please. to think of myself as a digital minimalist. Um, I'm usually very late on the, you know, of people adopting new technologies. Um, I just see what, what it does to other people and when I think, okay, that might be useful, then I, you know, I jump on that train as well. Um, and I think in, in education, we should really be careful in adopting everything just because it, it, just because it comes along and it might sound exciting. Um, and I think we should do that, especially with a, you know, with a clear idea of what we know works in education. <laughs> yes. Um, I think personal conversation, personal interaction is the most important thing ever. When I look at, uh, back at my you know, time in secondary school as an undergraduate, uh, the things that I remember are conversations I had, lectures I attended, because there was a performance, something happened, someone challenged me. Uh, I never remember any Zoom calls. Um, so I think we should do whatever we can to put center stage those conversations that don't require, that require technology because there's lights, there's water in the background, there's, there's places, but we have that. That's not new fancy technology. I think we need to make sure to put the infrastructure in place to have conversations between people uh, in, you know, working. Help me, help me on that. Absolutely, it, it deserves that. And please. Um, anyone in the room that wants to just yeah, tag, to team, tag team me or someone on, on the, please come up. Come on up. Yeah, come, on up. come and join the conversation. Oh, thank you so much. Because we need to dig into this because there's, uh, I'm, I'm filling whilst you come to take the stage. Um, you know, we need to dig into these questions around ed education technology because on the one hand, I know it, it enables, I'm a, I'm a visually impaired person. I would not be sitting here today, I wouldn't have my job if it would, wasn't for an awful lot of technology, some very practical technology that I rely upon, but also the fact that you can see it, other people can't, I get to do that. 
you know, so I cannot see without technology to help me. And so that enables me to participate in a, the academy. So how do we, on the one hand, notice that digital media has enabled people to contribute and to join the community, but on the other hand, it extracts resource and energy, it has a cost, there are imbalances in terms of who has access to that technology, it puts mediating films and screens in the way. You know, there, there's, a, there's a sort of, okay, that's quite a binary debate, but there's a debate that goes on there. So I'm, I'm gonna open the question up a little bit more to these questions around accessibility as well. But hello, good to, hello. Good to see you here, and, and welcome. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I mean, a couple of thoughts. Maybe because I brought one of the youngest attendants of, <laughs> uh -huh. of this event, and also what you said is, um, Maybe one question to think about is when do we start introducing these technologies? Maybe it's earlier than university time so that we have time to discover ourselves within those technologies. Like also what you said about Mirrorboard, I, I work remotely with an American company and, um, and I discover I'm a different person online. I'm, I'm a different person, I have a different personality, different way of organizing myself than in a room. And that's because I only did that when I was way older. Um, I, I discovered to be in a classroom with other kids when I was in my forming ages of you know, being a teenager. So maybe this discussion of what technology to use has to start way earlier than um, university age. How does, how does a university, how does a u new university plan for that? How do you, how do you build the infrastructure for the, the, the eight-year-olds now that are gonna be entering a university in a decade's time. How do we understand what the classroom, do we even need classrooms? What that teaching environment needs to be for a generation time. Bearing in mind, breaking ground, convincing government to, to give resource. How do, how do we visualize the educational technology for a new university when the futures are so complex? I mean, I'd suggest that, you know, with the discussion we were just having, you know, personal versus, you know, machine-aided learning, it's not an either or discussion, you know, you sort of pick the, pick the eyes out of it, you know, move deftly, pay attention to how things are working, how, how different things work for different people and try to just find a way that works the best for each student to help them learn <coughs> in the most interesting way and, in the, in, you know, in a, in a quick way too. I mean, I think the point of um, small children is really interesting. I've got a six-year-old at the moment who hasn't really discovered real computer games yet, so she thinks right. the math games and the spelling games that she plays are computer games and she loves them. You know? I can only imagine how much better these games, because they've got so much better since I was a kid, you know. I grew up in the, in the 80s and there were games then, and look, they've got a lot better. But they've got a long way to go, too. And in answer to your question of, you know, uh, how do you plan for something that's so far away, I think, you know, you, you don't. You take big guesses and you sort of move carefully and slowly through that and be prepared to challenge your assumptions, you know, iterate and move forward in an organic way keeping your options open so that you're, and being prepared to admit that decisions made a couple of years ago maybe aren't the best decision for now and alter course and, you know, just pay attention. That'd be, that'd be my uh, avoiding the question answer. So no, because it's the, it's the new flexibility and adaptability that we heard writ large in the presentations this morning, the extraordinary presentations this morning. You know, we saw, you know, there was a fluidity, there was something aqueous about you know, working and thinking and that criticality and how people encounter each other. And it may be that we're talking about the future of work as well, that the organization, the operational organization of this new institution needs to be step change different as well. Hi, yeah. thank you for Hello. joining us. Hi, yeah, thank you. No, I just wanted to uh, basically take a little bit a, a step back in the underlying assumption of what we think technology is in this discussion because we always have this assumption that we talk about a solution, uh, about a platform that enables us to do certain things. But in, in my experience, you know, I just like to mess around with things without knowing exactly uh, how I'm gonna use it. And when you pulled out your looking glass and the, the different settings on your, mm. um, on, on your iPad, I'm sure you, you didn't you know, look up the best way, uh, a kind of a prescriptive mode of how these technologies might help you, you would, you would also experiment and play yeah. around with yeah. it. Yeah. And, and I think this idea of looking at technology not always as a solution, but as a probe, as something that lets you intervene and, and get a response and, and mm -hmm. find something out is, is really important. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think this whole idea of the platform has changed in its meaning historically. You know, in the 70s, you would say, um, there's a famous article that Olivetti being a platform company, because it, ha it consisted of a lot of parts that didn't fit together and that were kind of unfinished partial solutions. But now there's this assumption that a platform is something that just lets you do everything and like everything fits together. But I think this, this moment of bricolage where you're just mm -hmm. putting together stuff and experimenting without really uh, saying, okay, I need this in order to do that and I need this in order to solve this problem. Because, I mean, obviously, very often technology is a solution to things, but it's not always the solution that we thought it would be in the beginning. So there was always a kind of a uh, serendipity that, mm. that, that played a role. We think about the primary school teacher in her classroom where she has Lego, she has plasticine, she has crayons, she has a garden outside, she has a window, she may have a screen, she has pencils, she has bricks, she has a library of books, a pile of books, and that experienced, brilliant teacher, she, she improvises creatively every day with that bricolage. That's her ed tech. And then for some reason, we go into tertiary education and suddenly we think there is this 400,000 pounds a year single solution that is the answer to all your questions. And that moment of bricolage and creativity and that palette of colors that the teacher can paint with every day, it goes, or it risks going. Hi, welcome to, Hi, the, to the fish bowl. I, I just have to, parentheses, I haven't slept in like 36 hours, so oh. my level of eloquence is really low right now, therefore my hesitance of coming up on this stage. Oh. But this is a theme that it's close to heart. Um, as the introduction said, I, I did work with children and my interest was on playgrounds and because I see play as learning for children and for not only for children, but for all of us. And just thinking about right here, right now, like I wonder how different would it have been for the students here to have this learning experience had it been experienced online on a platform, right? Like I think co-location is really important in that sense. But I think that co-location obviously is happening digitally too, but like the tangibility and the chance for serendipitous encounters, for bricolage, for learning, uh, play happens as an interaction between spaces, places, objects, and people, right? And like mm -hmm. you have to have those three parameters in order for play to happen. Um, that said, I do think that there, there is a lot of technological innovations that might allow for tangible interfaces, <laughs> to remember Hiroshi, um, to embed intelligence in these objects and to be able to network them beyond it living in one space. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities, but I think that just limiting it to digital uh, rather than tangible <laughs> is it's maybe something that I, I would push against. I think we have. Fantastic. Yeah, oh, careful. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the fishbowl. Thank you. <laughs> what are you thinking about EdTech, or maybe you want to go in another direction? All right, uh, my name is Orina Dorothy. I come Hi. from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I think one thing that is really close to my heart is um, experimentation. Someone mentioned one of the fellows, hello, <laughs> colorful t shirt. Um, he said that. <laughs> um, one of the goals for this university would, ha would have us being unapologetically experimental. Mm. And uh, for me, coming from a country that has uh, averagely limited resources, I've experienced first-hand shunning of experimental projects uh, because of funding, yeah? And a lot of people are not very willing to fund projects that are not already proven to work or are not already in the market. And so I think one of the technologies that will really help with this is simulation technologies, whether it's to be experienced via PC or by immersive technology such as virtual reality learning or augmented reality learning. It will, it will create a platform for a lot more experimentation in the case where resources are limiting and people won't be allowed to actually build physical prototypes of the very creative projects that they have in mind. So I think simulation will really work well. And probably one more thing that would add to that is um, more accurate models for simulation because some, some of these things, uh, they are there, they exist, but are not um, to a level of accuracy that would actually create a very good prototype. So integrating AI into this and making it to a level of accuracy that would allow proper experimentation before people get to build their physical prototypes. 
And I'm being a little bit cheeky here because I'm now going to build a bridge to our next conversation, which is about disciplines. But which, which part of that amazing landscape, let's call them arts and sciences now, but we might get rid of that definition. Which subjects benefit from simulation technologies? Is it the engineers? Is it the chemists? Is it the physicists? Is it those working in virology? But is it the literature student? Is it the, is it the historian? Who, who can benefit from simulation technologies? Um, I think it will mostly be the scientific and engineering students. Uh, but I think uh, with a simulation environment, you can really bring in the concept of an artist because it can be simulated in a digital environment. So it creates a platform where people can collaborate in a digital environment to actually showcase uh, a prototype that will be built in a physical environment. Right. Yeah. And there's some exciting opportunities there, isn't there? That the idea of a, an art object or of us conserving a particular artwork and us thinking about its digital twin and playing with that artwork, what it was 200 years ago, but you know, what state it might be in 200 years' time. But the historian starting to play with the same simulation technology as well to see what that might do with those pieces of evidence and to understand how arguments might be, might be generated and might develop as well which is extraordinary. Yeah. Any final thoughts before we start thinking more about discipline? Play is going to be important. You think... Play, you, play you is going to be important. And I just think that sometimes learning for me happens retroactively. Like, it's not that I set out to learn something. It's like that I reflect on what I learn. You know what I mean? So it's not yeah. like I'm out there to, like, learn something. Sometimes that happens. But usually I look back to what I learned, and it's much more than what I set out to learn at the beginning. So... How does learning actually happen and what contributes to that? It's, I think, it's a question that it's important to ask, like, what is learning and how do you learn to learn? And many of us work so hard to make sure that university authorities and those with their hands on funds don't see play and playfulness as in some way a secondary type of investigational learning. We know, exactly, we know <laughs> it can be the, the key to making that creative, inventive step. Yeah is by letting yourself go and declining the usual categories. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's with playing, but even formal learning, right? Like, mm -hmm. whatever formal learning setting happens too, you know, like, I still feel that learning happens a lot retroactively, you know? Like, you learn so much more from anything than what you set out to learn, whether it's playful learning or not. I mean, play is a completely different thing, but yeah, I think that play sadly has usually been seen as, like, a domain for children, so it's always taken as a childish thing to do. Um, which is okay. <laughs> we just need another word, maybe. But, yeah. We do, but it can be associated with rigorous, significant, um, original, incisive, smart, important research and investigation and criticality as well. These are not too different. It's not optional. These aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah. Hi. Hi again. Oh, that's loud. Sorry. Um, uh, I just wanted to add, I think for me it would be really important when we are talking about technology and stuff, it always comes about funding. And usually I know that from my university where I, where I grew up, so everybody has his own equipment, his own laboratory, his own separate devices which are used only to a very little extent. And they are really expensive and, and costly, so I think it, it, it's a must to share those. Mm -hmm. to have a full equipment in one shared laboratory where everybody can access it and book their time frames without having to fund them as a FFG, Horizon, whatever project. So I think that that's a must for me to, to allow there some, some, let's say, basic fundamental technologies to be available for all of those people there. I mean, there is great students having topics which are not so attractive to fundings compared to others, and they're always then on the bad side because they, they will never afford that. In museums and galleries, there are wonderful things called tinkering spaces, you know, where visitors can come in and there's a workshop of tools and we say, you know, where do you want to go? And we don't do that with our students. We don't say, you know, wh where do you want to explore? You know, what, how are we going to frame this learning? Let's build our learning space together. Um, you know, here's the toolbox that we have as, as you know, as researchers. What, what do you want to do? Final comments, maybe? Yeah, I think that in that sense, Fab Labs are wonderful spaces yeah. for shared digital technologies where, like, you can you know, share projects and have them replicated mm -hmm. in different parts of the world and you can exchange knowledge in a very fast and accessible way. I think playgrounds are great resources for that too, <laughs> you know, yeah. in some ways. And I, I, yeah, communal spaces, kitchens, labs, everything, um, as long as it's shared, for sure. Yeah, and also, 
I really echo your point uh, about access to technology. If you think about the speed at which uh, science has to come out in order to keep up with everything that's going on, and it's just accelerating, and uh, and have access to just computing power yeah. will mm -hmm. become a very important resource in the future. So yes, that has oh. to be yeah important yeah. point. And yeah. and just to close. One second, as, as an alumni from the Media Lab and like having followed a little bit of this history of it, you know, like I think that what made the Media Lab very important when it started was that it had very high speed internet and it was the one and only place where you mm. could go and do it, right? Mm. But it was still a physical location where people from all these different disciplines were coming to use that one resource and apply it into their different disciplines, right? And that made some of the magic happen. Um, I wonder what there is next, you know, that could be like this. I mean, internet, of course, and the distribution of it, and the fact that we all have access to it and do different things with it. Uh, but what is that one resource that could be shared uh, equally that could, you know, potentialize uh, personal disciplines for everyone? Fantastic. Hope From I was eloquent for two seconds at least. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and, and remarkable as well to do that after so much traveling. So, <laughs> so from platform to bricolage and from, you know, seeing technology as the solution to seeing technology as one of many beginnings of, 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 of a learning opportunity. Thank you so much for helping us frame that. We should thank our, uh, this, this round. So let's, let's fill our seats again. So, um, clicking through to one final kind of conversation. So Lauren, we're going to be thinking about disciplines now. So I'm particularly keen to, to draw into the conversation. Those of you that haven't had a chance to contribute, uh, and I know there's some of our fellows who, who will have an opportunity to step forward as well. Um, three different questions here about you know, roles of partners, you know, how universities can encourage interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary collaboration. And how we'll merge and these themes, how these emerging things will reshape traditional boundaries. Maybe we can sort of merge those two sort of first questions together. We spoke quite a lot. You presented so eloquently and compellingly this morning what a university might be if it declined the two cultures of humanities and science. If it had, and that brilliant extension to our lexicon, not just a disciplinary perspective, we stay within our walled areas, not just a multidisciplinary perspective, we might do work acknowledging that there are other walled areas but we may not interact, not just interdisciplinary perspective where actually we stay in our area but we, you know, maybe we learn from others, but that genuinely transdisciplinary approach where actually we look and we assemble and we come together and say, what's the problem? And you've been working in a brilliantly transdisciplinary way. You're not defining yourself by your disciplines. You're saying, what's the work that needs to be done? And let's bring our talent and our energy and our drive and our equity to that together. And together, we will build a new vocabulary, we'll build new methodologies. You built a new model, a new conceptual model. That's you as transdisciplinary workers. But that last comment we had this morning about post-disciplinarity, is this just getting in the way? This whole kind of preoccupation with wanting to label a particular mode of thought and calling it a discipline. So please, I'm really keen to encourage up on the stage now and to be part of the fishbowl, those that want to talk about science and arts, humanities and digital, these questions around what is a discipline? Do we still need disciplines? Are we in the era of the end of the discipline? Will this new university of digital transformation Will it actually be an utterly new model for us to think about what disciplines need to be? There has been a rush of people onto the stage. Give me that microphone. Yeah, absolutely. Are you happy to speak first? Yeah, you're happy to? Okay. Uh, so, um, I, I, I was like, I have to go up because I study a program which is called cross-disciplinary strategies. So <laughs> you can imagine it's all about disciplines, how to rethink disciplines, how to cross disciplines. And I think for that, yeah, I think it's, go, in my head, it needs to go in the direction of post-disciplinarity. Because if we want really to step forward, we need to question how we see an expert. You can be an expert mm. in one field, but how do you define a field? Where does it stop? Where does it start? Like we, we decided to say that this is social science and this is uh, 
computer engineering and then we have people who start now computational social science. So maybe you can also be an expert in this field. We just define it that way. And I think it has to go away, maybe not finding more disciplines, but abolishing it after all. And thinking in it, or like how I like to work is take the methodologies of different disciplines and see it more as a toolkit. So I have this methodologies from, I work with, a lot with like biologists, um, how they work, but also social science methodologies and art methodologies, and just collect it together. So um, <laughs> there's, sorry, there's interesting ways for, or like the workshops we have in uni are also really interesting. Like there's people working on city planning and then an industrial designer comes in and you build now a prototype of your project. Right. Right. What does that mean? How does yeah. that look like? Yeah. And I think when you start working like this, you create much more interesting and much more, um, like you get the new perspectives. So mm. I, f I think that's how I would see it going to in the future in this direction. Oh my goodness, what a start. Our obsession with disciplines and let's work backwards and think it's about where expertise is. It's a genius idea to start. Let's keep going. Where are we going next? So I might be a little bit controversial here, but um, I think disciplines are nothing else than labels and labels create groups, right? Groups and group thinking and being in, in an in-group and out-group psychologically has a lot to do with survival, right? Mm. So we have to be mindful that Labels and groups actually serve a purpose in evolutionary terms. So although we want to be, to be interdisciplinary and we want to foster creativity and the working together, they, they still will hang around. And we're creating just a new label that's called is interdisciplinary. It's exactly like as, as humans, we fall into this trap or we, we basically are are um, conditioned to create groups and to uh, create social structures. So, although I don't have an answer for that, to be honest, I, I, don't, I don't really know, but I think labels are still gonna be with us for a very long time. So it's gonna be hard to just say, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna be a, I don't know, social scientist. Uh, um, my background is, is, is business uh, and now psychology. And I can tell you they're very, very different. Um, and they will still be with us for a very long time. So as, as human beings, we are evolving, but we still have an uh, evo evolution behind us um, that uh, probably we haven't, we haven't quite caught up where we are now with technology. So it's gonna be interesting, but I, 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 will, I will say I doubt that labels are gonna go away and disciplines are gonna go away. Those disciplinary labels, they give us identity, structure, yeah, and community absolutely. straight away. Exactly, ah. exactly. Uh, when you go into a group, the first thing you do is to figure out how you connect to other people within this group. And labels are just one way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talk to people about politics, you talk to people about, um, if you're in Australia, you talk about uh, sports. You, in, if you're in Melbourne, where I come from, you talk about AFL. The first question is, what AFL team do you support? Mm -hmm. So you're always trying to figure out what your connection is with other people. So if we then think about not working interdisciplinary, we then have to figure out what will the connections be that we have with other people. How will we find our group that we're going to work with and to, uh, that, that we're going to kind of um, integrate with um, in an interdisciplinary way? Thank you. Wendy, did you want to come in here, help us? How do we unknot this Gordian knot of what uh, is a discipline and do we need it? Uh, I don't know. I was, I was thinking about a couple of different things that have come up and also uh, from the really great ideas that were coming up earlier uh, before lunch. I mean, we're going to have to have disciplines and we're going to have to have a breaking down of disciplines because you do have to call it something. I mean, if everybody gets rid of their last names today, we're going to have a difficulty knowing what to call one another tomorrow. And, and even if those names evolve and change, that's okay, but we have to have somewhere to be able to start with. And I was also thinking about this, if we, what happens if you have a university where everything is interdisciplinary and you don't call anything anything and then at some point the interdisciplinary people need to be working and they don't know what they're working on because they don't have a background in mathematics or they don't have a background in biology, they have a background in a little bit of everything. And I think one of the things that's also important about disciplines is that the difference between do we, do we become specialists or do we, do we 
gain skills and work in technology in the things that we love or the things that we need to learn to be able to make something happen. So how many of you have sat there and thought, oh God, I have to learn how to do this. I have to learn how to weld because what I envision requires welding and I don't really wanna learn how to weld. And so is that a discipline or is that not a discipline? Um, and so the idea of do you define yourself by what you can do? Do you define yourself by what you can love? Do you define yourself in a way that other people can understand you? If I tell you what I do, what I studied, are you going to understand what it is that mm -hmm. I studied or not? Mm -hmm. And will people in 20 years understand what I studied and why? And so I'm, and another quick thing regarding the role of external partners. Um, so I, I live in Austria. Every person that works in the volunteer fire departments, they are specialists in cultural heritage of the buildings around here because they have to know how they're built, they have to know how to rescue them from fires. And so you have this other layer of people who are disciplinary specialists in something, but they're actually just part of the Freiwillige Feuerwehr. Yeah, so I'm not so skeptical at all. No. I think the students this morning showed that actually you can be post-disciplinary and find a home in that because they acted as a group and felt a sense of belonging even though they were interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or post-disciplinary. So I don't, I think, I think that's not something to be afraid of. Um, what excites me a lot is to bring these kind of methodologies and this prototyping and this visual techniques that you use to like the traditional disciplines. For example, I come from biology originally, which is a very standardized, uh, well, very standardized discipline. But if you create an artwork with Charlotte Jarvis on uh, the future of wombs or on, what did you do with her exactly, a biotechnology, bio art, how cool would it be to present that again to the biologist? To kind of bring it back to the discipline you borrow from or the methodology you borrow and then bring it back to the people um, that have no clue what was what these artistic uh, practices that you use are. So I think it can be very valuable to be aware of disciplines, to be aware of like the campfires that are there and the people you can talk to, and just knock on these doors and show them what you're doing because that's also the way that they are going to change their methods and ways and be open to more interdisciplinary people. We do have a couple more minutes for before we wrap this particular section. Do I have any other people that would like to come up? Join us. I see. Yeah. One. Come on up. It's Come on up. Team. Thank you. Do we have more? Okay. Our final couple of minutes then. Thank you. So please, um, would you like to start first? Just to, just to, to reply to that. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with what you said. I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that interdisciplinary work isn't, isn't uh, valuable and shouldn't be pursued. Absolutely not. I think I'm more uh, encouraging you in general to think about the biases that we have. And, and putting labels of thi on things is something that humans do if you want it or not. So take it as you wish, but you just have to deal with it at some stage. Yeah, I, I believe that um, we can also not like take it so severely and see interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity also as like a, as an energy or a space that can, that can be. And I would say as a person who mm, started out in art school where, you know, it's like, wow, pretty utopian, which is also nice when you're in a university because you're, you're safe and you can think, um, you can have this environment where you can think big. Um, but I, I, I never felt so welcome to go and like look over the shoulder of an engineer. Thankfully this has changed somewhat over time, but if I just knew that in the air there was an openness to collaborate or an openness to these exchanges, then I would feel much safer to go in. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's got to be like, I'm going to like drop my disciplinary hat and, and be this like weird blob in the middle. 
Um, but it's more that like, I'm welcome to it and maybe the synergies come together and something does happen, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like, we're gonna die. Because <laughs> we're not, we don't have our labels. <laughs> I'm going to bring us to our final kind of, kind of comment before we have a moment of kind of oh, hygiene sorry. and clean. Oh, okay, last two comments, last two comments. Yeah, I, I don't want to define interdisciplinarity, but I just wanted to share my experience from, I don't know how many years in academia. Um, interdisciplinary scholars need to think very, in a very tactical way, how they go about their careers, because the ugly truth is that on the job market, you have a huge disadvantage. It's everyone always praises interdisciplinarity, but it's harder to get a, to, to get a tenure track position uh, if you describe yourself as interdisciplinary. So my recommendation is use disciplines as an infrastructure. Don't look at them as a prison. So uh, the, the skill of a transdisciplinary researcher is to be able to uh, to basically to use these labels to their advantage and change them when necessary. You you have many hats, just switch them and uh, make sure that your added value of a, let's say, bigger context that you know because of your interdisciplinary background, you, you see more than, than other people uh, and, and use that to your advantage. That, that was just like what, what I observed and I, I don't want to qualify whether yeah, it's good okay. or bad, but it's, it's in many places the reality. Seeing these problems in the round, it's what the fish bowls are like. You have the honor of the final comment. I just wanted to share an observation. I agree with uh, Gerhard that labels will stick, and I think we should be aware of the role that these labels play in you know, the interaction between the university and society. Um, universities are a lot about creating legitimacy. Uh, when policymakers do something, they need some experts saying that that's a good idea. And usually you need an expert in an area that is relevant for the kind of stuff that you're going to do. For example, the, the uh, e e economics is the master discipline. If you're an economist and you say some uh, policy is good because it drives growth, that gives you a lot of legitimacy. Now I think that uh, it's important to you know, rethink how we do that and interdisciplinary teams might be an answer to you know, overcoming that. But I think it's a fact that uh, you know, disciplines create a very strong role in this imagination of what the expert is who gives legitimacy to, to certain plans. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. We should give a round of applause to our final Fishbowl <laughs> contributors. Okay, so in our final couple of minutes, um, we, this is just the start of the conversation, right? And there are going to be questions that we haven't asked. And so if you did scan the document, um, you saw some of the what we call clean the tank questions. So we want you to think about what were the questions that weren't asked? Whether it was this morning that didn't come up or through today's conversation here on, on, on the stage just now, or what did you agree with? What sat well with you? What didn't sit so well with you? How would you want to explore these topics further? How might we get more curious about these different structures, about these labels, about the way in which we convene, communicate, collaborate, and be in community with one another? So, Ross, final thoughts before we well, close? It's not for us to conclude or, or sum up or synthesize or to open the envelope and tell you what the answer is. Um, the, 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 the solutions, the ways forward, the futures are yours, um, and you're gonna be our navigators and leaders. You showed us this morning that the futures for this university will be about building something that's absolutely experimental, but also something that is experiential as well. It'll be the whole body, and it'll be that body in the, in the world and aware of that. You showed us in your conceptual model a, a, a future university that will be both at an individual level, an interpersonal level, highly empathetic, but also at a societal level, looking out, seeing the systems and the ecosystems, highly expansive as well. Everything that this university will do, you told us in the core of your model, will be equitable and it will be ethical. And we need to demand of ourselves and of our leaders and our funders exactly what does that mean for a university so that we can remove and erase those power structures that are there inherently within that, that, that organization of the university. Hundreds of years worth 
of hierarchy that's baked into that structure. You're smashing that down. And finally, you said, most importantly, this is going to be about play. It's going to be about heart. It's going to be about imagination. And the word I wrote down so many times this morning, this is going to be so exciting. Mm -hmm. We thank, thank you, you so much. We thank you for your time and your energy. And we've had a little bit of a switch in, in, the, in the schedule, the agenda. So we're going to have a 30-minute break. And we'll come back at 1400 at 4 o'clock. So you have 30 minutes to rest, <laughs> get rejuvenated before the rest of the day. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you. For thank you.